From New Jersey, this is Low Fidelity. I'm Jeff Heller. And I'm Mike Labrie. On this episode, we will explore the innovations of Rhythm Games' Parappa the Rapper and Vib Ribbon from Nana Onsha. You can support Low Fidelity by reviewing us on iTunes, subscribing to us on our Reddit and YouTube channels, and by following at LoFi Podcast on Twitter. All the links you need are in the description of this episode. You are always welcome, of course, to share any feedback in the comments or send us an email to feedback at lowfidelity.info. Welcome to Low Fidelity, everybody. It has been a while since our last episode, but I think uh, that's kind of par for the course at this point. We're very happy to bring up a topic that, Mike, I think it's safe to say both you and I are very enthusiastic about. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is one of those ones where I'm like, all right, this is what we're doing. I I don't really need to listen to anything. I suppose I will in preparation. Yeah, this is definitely deep in our history, I think. Before we get to that, I think the first thing just needs to be said uh, for our listeners who at the end of episode 17 heard that we were going to be doing a review of Steve Reich's drumming. Oops, wait, sorry. I mean, episode 16, my bad. And uh, sadly, we did try it, but our show format didn't really work with that piece. And so we may tackle it again at a later time, but we're going to do the piece justice when we do eventually talk about it. With that said, though, I'm actually really super excited to introduce to everybody a YouTube channel that I've been following for a while. So this YouTube channel is called Anatomy of a Track. Uh, I, of course, will make sure to link it in the show notes. And according to the profile of this channel, they publish what's called graphic notation videos. And I actually think this is a topic that, Mike, you and I can talk about at some point, which is the evolution of music notation, because with the five lines and the clefs, it's at the point where we could pretty much get rid of that and just do new things now that we have all this technology that we have to represent. I mean, I guess so. (laughs) It's been a long time since I was in this world. I mean, I'm talking middle school, I guess a little bit in the high school when I was uh, I played saxophone for a while there. I probably couldn't get back to reading music, but this is the kind of thing where I don't know if it's just because of the way that you and I work work with uh, audio and visual mediums uh, and some of our past projects. But yeah, I, I watch this stuff. I'm like, yeah, I, I understand everything about this. I understand what it means, how it means, what it's conveying to me. Yeah, exactly. And there are actually a multitude of channels that do this kind of thing. But what makes Anatomy of a Track different is how each song is actually styled purposefully for that song. And also, I think he's quite different because his typography is stellar. I love it so it's much. so good. Yeah. The channel has videos for artists like Gil Scott Heron, Radiohead, Sufjan Stevens, The Talking Heads, but also more experimental artists like Steve Reich, Autecra, Fortet. And you can imagine that the way I found this channel was through the Steve Reich music mm, video. Yep. But the Gil Scott Heron track in particular, this is another one that I really love because it's for the song New York is Killing Me, and it's actually styled to look like the New York subway map, which is so clever. Now, it turns out that Anatomy of a Track is run by this guy named Johannes Lampert from Austria. The quick story as to how I figured out that they were a listener of our show. I had already been watching his videos for about a year. And then one day after posting a tweet about the release of our uh, Steve Reich episode, I get a notification that Anatomy of a Track followed us. Seriously, Mike, I jumped out of my chair. I can picture that for sure. Yep. Yeah, but I jumped out of my chair at work. (laughs) I deeply respect Johannes's work. He has an incredible eye for design, but I will be sure to put a link to his channel on the description of this episode. So please check it out. I think when I talked to him, he said he was working on commissions right now. So hopefully he'll be able to get back to posting videos on YouTube again. And yeah, just enjoy it because it's really stellar stuff. All right. I think it's safe to say that we're good with all the beginning stuff. And let's get right to our topic. We are going to be talking about none other than Japanese video game development company, Nana Onsha, which is, I would say, like another moniker for its founder, Masaya Matsura. So Matsura, musician, video game designer uh, based in Tokyo, that that's Japan, obviously, uh, formed the group Size with singer Shaka shortly after graduating from university in 1983. He would compose tracks for the band as well as play all the instruments, including synthesizer, electric guitar, bass, and some of the songs will win on the soundtracks of popular anime of the late 80s. Uh, you may have heard something called City Hunter before. Technological advancements of personal computing uh, in the 90s would inspire Matsura to shift focus to gaming, where he would become the first Japanese musician to release a CD-ROM game. Ah, uh, yes, Jeff, the CD-ROM, the multimedia days. Yeah, no kidding. And this one was called The Seven Colors. It's a point-and-click adventure game for the original Apple Macintosh computer based on the music of size. It was released in April 1993, which is remarkable because it was five days before the release of The Seventh Guest, and it's months before Mist. so it was really ahead of the curve. Jeff, were you a hypercard kid? 
Yes, I absolutely was a HyperCard kid. I was going to say, I'm pretty sure we've talked about HyperCard at some point on some show or personal conversation. Uh, yeah, I was big into HyperCard scripting uh, my stacks, my decks. And so when I was looking at this game, I'm like, yeah, this is definitely that era. I was probably like OS 6 at that point, something like that, right? Uh, but it was incredible looking at what was made there and the way that sound effects and, and music was integrated into it. For anybody who's not familiar with the software, just imagine trying to make a game out of software like PowerPoint. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> kind of. I think that's what it was. It was pretty much like a slideshow software. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, some great, amazing games were made out of it. But he, it just turns out, and we're going to see this pattern with his games too, that they just mm -hmm. seem to be one step ahead of everybody else. Right. Now, this game, The Seven Colors, which, by the way, you can find on YouTube, and there's actually a site that's trying to build an emulator for it as well. It was super rare. It did win him the Multimedia Grand Prix Award and would be the first of numerous honors and awards that he would receive for his innovations in game design. So here we are, 1993. That would also be the year that Masura would create Nana Onsha, a video game development company, and would dissolve size three years later after having released 10 albums over its lifespan. Uh, we got a little note here, Nana Onsha. It just sounds like a cool name, and it really is a cool name, but it also kind of roughly translates to Seventh Sound Company. But it's the kind of thing Matsura is like, yeah, it's just whatever. It sounds cool. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> now, 1996 was a defining year for Nana Onsha. The company would release their first game, Tune In Glue, on the doomed Apple Band. Bandai Pippin game system. Uh, can we just pause for a second there? Apple working with Bandai is crazy to me. This alternate timeline, not alternate timeline, a real timeline when these companies were working together. Well, it's safe to say because the system didn't do too well, the game also didn't really receive that much fanfare. However, it would be followed up in December of that year by a smash hit on the Sony PlayStation, a game that would solidify Nana Onsha's place as a Sony PlayStation developer and the first game whose music we are going to review here on Low Fidelity, Per Rappa the Rapper. In Parappa the Rapper, you play as Parappa, a paper-thin cartoon dog trying to win the affection of flower girl Sunny Funny. Through a series of wacky circumstances, you get Parappa to do various things like learn kung fu and sell items at a flea market by pressing buttons on the controller that match the symbols on screen in time with the music. A gameplay experience that, essentially, marks the beginning of the modern era of rhythm games. The music of Parappa is heavily rooted in mid-90s hip-hop and R&B, with accents of New Jack Swing, breakbeats, reggae, jungle, jazz, and a heavy dose of circus music amongst other styles filling the soundtrack. So I got my PlayStation in 1997. Uh, I was one of those people looking forward to Final Fantasy VII, so I bought my PlayStation ahead of that game's release. Uh, and I think for a while, I didn't actually own any games, but it did come with a demo disc. Now, I've been trying to track, I don't think I have the demo disc itself anymore, which I'm very upset about. Um, I'm trying to track down exactly which one it was. I think it was volume two of whatever series it was. And this is before the PlayStation magazine had demo discs. It was like a, a Sony PlayStation pack in original and in addition to I think two characters in the Tekken 2 demo it had the first stage of Parappa so I played the first stage of Parappa a lot <laughs> in 1997 and I was big into the game and as soon as it came out or whenever I, I discovered that it indeed was out and it was probably done with Final Fantasy 7 I uh, picked it up and it has been a part of my life in my collection ever since I have seen that story a lot with the demo CD being the reason yeah. that people find this game in my case I anybody who knows me knows that I'm so so behind with video game systems. I didn't see a PlayStation 1 until I went to college in 2000. And I think it was in 2001 where a friend of mine had a modified PlayStation 1 mm -hmm. and had a bunch of games for it from Japan, which was commonplace because I was in Manhattan at the time and you could just go to Chinatown and buy these systems and buy these games. It wasn't cheap, but you could do it. And that's pretty much how I discovered it was with the actual game. And I want to mention though that, and this is true with both games on this episode, we're really not going to focus on the gameplay elements all that much. We are going to mention them when they're relevant, but really this is going to be focused on the music more than anything else. To that end, if you're interested in reviews of the gameplay, however, there are plenty of videos that you can look at, and I'm going to link to one here just so you can see uh, a review of the gameplay of Parappa, just so you get an idea of what the experience was like. But before we get into the music, let's do the required listening first. And I think there are some things you can listen to before diving into Parappa soundtrack. We're going to start with what I would call pre-CD game system soundtracks. And this 
this is important because the PlayStation 1, it, correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, this mm -hmm. is the first game system that became popular using CDs as their game method. Uh, yes and no. I mean, the PlayStation and the Saturn and the Saturn actually predated the PlayStation uh, a little bit, but they were effectively at the exact same time when they came out there, uh, 94 in Japan. And we mentioned other things like the Bandai and Playdia, but nothing had really taken off. But this was the transition era for the largest of the the, the main um, video game home console developers. Yeah. Let's take a look at some cartridge favorites then. Mike, why don't you go first? There's a, a couple things that I could point to. I'm actually going to go over to the Sega Mega Drive or the Genesis as we got it. There are uh, maybe two soundtracks in particular I want to note. One in particular uh, is not a Japanese release, but I think it's really important because it's what brought funk and hip hop culture really to the forefront in the most mainstream of video games. And that's, of course, Toji and Earl on the Genesis from 1991. Really innovative soundtrack um, and it used the strengths of the Genesis's FM chip so you got some real slapping sounds in there that sounds great coming out of the Genesis and a lot of composers weren't necessarily great using <laughs> the strengths of the Genesis chip but just um, knowing where we're going to go in Parappa I think it's important to say that some of this culture was being represented in video games and I think Toe Jam and Earl is a great one. I do have to give a nod as well to uh, my boy Yuzo Koshiro with the, uh, the Bare Knuckle, the Streets of Rage soundtracks. Two is my favorite. I know a lot of people like the first Teresa Ray soundtrack as well. Uh, lots of great like techno thumping hip hoppy beats in there as well. Just a really, really good stuff that's it's already making its way into games and it's going to be coming more and more into the forefront into the mid and late 90s as we will be talking about. I have to second your recommendation of Toe Jam and Earl. I absolutely adore that soundtrack. Also, I don't know if you knew this, Mike, but were you aware of the, I guess, sequel, You if you could call it that? that came out on the Switch back in the groove? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and there was, uh, I think, originally a sequel back on Genesis, but I know there was a more recent one as well, yeah. Not only did we get this lo-fi version of yeah. these funk songs, which are fantastic, but the new version updates them in a very nice way, thanks to producers Matt Kahn and Macaulay Culkin, of all people. <laughs> it's definitely worth checking out. I definitely second that recommendation. All right, for my recommendation, I am going to bring up Secret of Mana, as it's called in the US, but in Japan, it is Seiken Densetsu 2, and this is by Hiroki Kikuta. I love the soundtrack. I think it pushes the chipset of the SNES to its limit with the different kind of styles and instruments that are being used. Mike, what can you tell me about the SSMP chip? So here's a real interesting thing. Did you know that the sound chip in the Super Nintendo is actually a Sony sound chip? No, I did not know that. <laughs> yes, it is indeed. And the Super Nintendo sound chip is really known for being not sample based, but being able to use samples of things. That's why you have a lot of games that sound very very different from each other. Like the sound of Final Fantasy VI sounds very different from the sound of Secret of Mana, sounds very different from the sound of The Legend of Zelda Link to the Past. It's just a really, really good <laughs> sound chip that got a lot of great usage, a lot of innovative usage back then. Before we get to the music, we have yet another required listening, and it's the style New Jack Swing. I think this is important to bring up because this style shows up a lot in Parappa. It's not the only style, but it's more common amongst the songs. Technically, you could hear it in popular music for the first time in Janet Jackson's Control from 1986. Yeah. But producer Teddy Riley from 90s group Blackstreet is credited as the inventor. He's actually a producer and was producing even when he was in Blackstreet. Mm -hmm. So there are many, many examples of the style. I'm going to put in the background here the song Show Business from A Tribe Called Quest because I think it also gives a very good uh, example of that style. You can definitely hear it in the percussion. And just like with hip hop, Parappa's soundtrack is littered with samples. We're going to mention those samples when they come up, but just be prepared because uh, if we don't reference it, you can find it on whosample.com. It has a good number of them. Oh, and real quick, the reason why I even bring up New Jack Swing is because this game is so funky. Even the loading screen mm -hmm. has this incredible beat behind it. All right. Now, the way we're going to tackle this soundtrack, there are 44 tracks. <laughs> so... <laughs> We have the songs that are used as stages in the game. We're going to cover those and maybe some notes here and there about the in-between tracks. But let's start off with track number one, which is Parappa's Greeting. It's the main theme. I think a lot of the main thematic elements are going to be introduced here. Yep. It's short, sweet, but I actually really love it because I, I love the melody behind this because it's kind of out there. It is referenced in a few other tracks. Mm -hmm. Just a really good introduction before we get into the main game here. And also uh, we get the very important... I gotta believe! 
<laughs> I got to redeem. I got it. As I was saying the other day, I, I turned this lyric into whatever is on my mind at any given time. I've decided that now the lyric is I got to eat bees. <laughs> That's funny because I was doing a similar thing, but I was trying to make it very negative. Like I got to deceive. <laughs> yep. Yep. We pretty much go into environmental songs and this is tracks two through eight here. I don't really see much to talk about here besides these cartoonish circus music type, like chaotic circus music tracks. And it has more to do with the actual gameplay that you don't get listening to the soundtrack. So it's this is why we're skipping them. It's basically because they don't really contribute much to the listening experience necessarily. They're important. They show up in the game. But I don't think from a musical standpoint or a music review standpoint that they actually really contribute much. I will say, though, about track two, Jet Baby, that I think this is Rodney Greenblatt, which is the, the illustrator of the game, supposedly doing the vocal here. Oh, OK. Jet Baby flies, she flies to I'll make sure to link to his website so you can see what kind of style he has. Rather interesting, but yeah, let's let's go straight to track nine, which is Chop Chop Master Onion. I think this is really where we get to the more fulfilling musical sections of the soundtrack. Master Onion is played by, or rapped by, Ryu Watabe, who happened to be one of the collaborators on this project. There's a really interesting interesting story about how this game came about and it's very much about collaboration between three people. You have this person Gabin Ito who wrote the story, Watabe Ryu who is the main rapper who would interpret lyrics given to him by Matsura and then turned into English basically. So we can blame Watabe for some of the English transliterations here, but I think his rapping style is really interesting as Master Onion, kind of the stereotypical kung fu teacher. This is really where we get to see the New Jack Swing in the background. It's very percussive, very busy. It's actually based off of a sample called uh, the Assembly Line by the Commodores. And according to who sampled, by the way, this beat's been used about 333 times. <laughs> You hear it everywhere. Yeah, you do. Yeah, exactly. What would you say about the lyrics to Parappa? <laughs> They're very literal. It's just descriptive of what's happening, which makes it very difficult to talk about in a context other than just the, the story of the game. And really what's going on here is Parappa's lusting after this flower girl and he's trying to do anything to get it on her good side and impress her. So now he's out learning to fight. And that's literally what they're rapping about, even though it's really literal. <laughs> it's super fun because it's doing this call and response thing, which is going to be the entire point of the game and all of the music. I also want to mention too that I think depending on how well you play the game, other lyrics can enter into it based on how well you're doing. Yeah, and the music actually dynamically adjusts too. You start getting this honking sound at you. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit more in the, the next main track about how that music changes too. They're actually the next few tracks. We're going to move on to tracks 10 through 16, more environmental music, but I do want to bring up one track that really stands out to me, which is Smooth Life of Mine. And it's basically 55 seconds of fast tempo guitar jazz. I don't know about you, Mike, but after one listen to this, I instantly memorized it. All right, Mike, before we go into track 17, tell me what happens in the story that gets us to this point. <laughs> there's a bunch of stuff going on. So now he's learned to fight, but there's this other guy out there, Joe Chin, who shows up and he's, you know, he's tall. He's, he's well built. Uh, everyone loves him. He has quite a chin. He has quite a chin. He has a car. He has a convertible that's uh, about nine miles long in the game. Parappa's going to sit in the back seat while Sonny's up front. Um, so Parappa's like, I, I got to get a car. I got to get a driver's license. So um, this is what he's got to do to continue to impress the girl. Which brings us to track 17, Instructor Mussolini's Rap. I posted this on Twitter to introduce the fact that we were going to be recording again, and I think it was very apt to have a picture of Mussolini and Mussolini. Yes. Just so you can see how well the illustrator did. <laughs> very nice Rodney Greenblatt. I have to tell you, Mike, this is my favorite track. It's, uh, I'm back and forth. Like, I really love the original, the, the first Chop Chop song, just going back to the demo. But as a song, I don't know, I really like this. I love the flow of the lyrics, the rhythm. It's so good. Yes, exactly. And something I want to bring up with this track is the type of consonants that they use. And full credit to Ryu Watabe for this, because as the person who is taking the lyrics from Matsura and turning them into English, he is really going for words that are matching the rhythm well. And whether this is a conscious effort or not, he does an incredibly good 
good job because lyrics like check and turn the signals to the right, they're so explosive yeah. with the consonants that it goes so well with this punchy background music. I mean, the rhythm of the words, I think, is really what makes them memorable, not just the musicality or uh, or the lyrics themselves. It's really just how the words sound. Check and turn the signal to the right. Check and turn the signal to the right. Step on the gas, now turn to the right. Step on the gas, now turn to the right. Check and turn the signal to the left. Check and turn the signals to the left. Step on the gas, now turn to the left. Step on the gas, now turn to the left. Not even the percussion is punchy, but the piano that's there, it's a tack piano. Now, if you remember from our review of Rumors by Fluid Mac, the tack piano shows up in Don't Stop There, and it's really more of a percussive piano because each note is punched in. There's kind of like this little pop sound at the beginning of each note. So that being in here works very well towards this really punchy kind of sound. But interestingly enough, the music is not original. It's actually a sample yeah. from the German krautrock pioneer Can. And we have talked about Can before. This showed up in our required listening of Animal Collective Sung Tongues. So here they come up again. It's this very interesting instrumentation. And the music itself, this is why it's so memorable to me. If you listen to the main line of that song, the bass just doesn't seem to work with it. It's it, like the bass is heading in a more, I would say, like maniacal direction, mm -hmm. whereas the piano is very sort of cheery, like this kind of saloon music. Yeah, yeah. It shouldn't work together, and yet it really, really does. I, I think where you could go with this and where they do actually go in the game is if you start rapping poorly, the tone of the piano changes and it starts sounding very, very ominous as if you're going to crash. And I think this is the kind of thing that a video game can do with music, uh, just dynamically changing it. It was just perfect. A good point you bring up with that. I've tried to recreate it myself a little bit, and it turns out that what they did to the song, what makes it even more kind of maniacal, and, and like you said, when you do something wrong, it turns a little bit more devious. It's because they detuned it, sort yep, of like yeah. a way of making it sound like an old radio where or the record player is getting broken, where it's slowing down the playing. So I think mm -hmm. that has a lot to do with how it shows up in the game, and it, things are only getting more broken the worse you do. Yeah, it's, it's a phenomenal track. I love how this plays together with the game. And the song itself really engaging. I can tell you, my favorite part of this song is somewhere in the middle, and you gotta play a sample of this. It's when they briefly stop and then mm. they do close the door, and there's just that, uh, and then they drive off again. I love that vocal addition to it there. It's it's just so good. Yes, thank you for bringing that up because that is Sandra Williams who is providing the vocal here. Her sassiness is fantastic in this track. She does an excellent job. All right, let's take it over to tracks 18 through 22. Again, kind of more interstitial music here, but I do want to shout out Paradise, which I actually love because it reprises that main theme of the game, which as yeah. we should know by now, it, I'm very much attached to that main theme, but it gives us this relaxed vibe. So I appreciate how they reinterpret it and gives it more of uh, an environment for this game. But we're about to go into another major track. Mike, tell me what happens here. Parappa, now, now he can fight. Uh, he's got his driver's license. So he borrows his dad's car and uh, promptly crashes it. So <laughs> now he's going to make money. All right, so track 23, Prince Flea Swallows Rap. Another great track. Yeah, I think de depending on the day, like maybe this is my favorite track. I don't know. Yeah, definitely a highlight. I think the reggae here works perfectly. This is actually a slowed down sample from the Joe Cocker song, Feeling All Right, which is a staple of 60s music. There's also hints of jungle in the background, so I appreciate the percussion here. It's so good. I love, I love it so much. I quote this song probably on a daily basis, whether I'm just walking around singing in the rain or in the snow. Money, money, money is all you need. All you ever need is nice and friendly like they're so bad the lyrics but i love them so much they're bad but at the same time perfect for what is essentially a kid's game right yeah yeah and the voice behind the track here is Lanky Don, who has music of his own. You can go check that out. I think it's worth it because I really love his vocal inflection here. Exactly what you would expect from a reggae track. But his delivery of things like all you ever need is to be nice and friendly. Money, money, money is all you need. As contradictory as I think those quotes are. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Still a really great performance. In the rain or in the snow. In the rain or in the snow. Got the, got the funky flow. Got the, got the funky flow. In the rain or in the snow. In the rain or in the snow. Got the got the funky flow. Got the got the funky flow. 
Also, um, even though we're reviewing the music here, you know, we have to not give it too much seriousness because there's a lyric here about a lucky skunk somewhere. Yeah, I mean, it's for sale. It's like he holds it up. It says he's at a flea market. He's got all sorts of tchotchkes and, and garbage. But I think, Mike, something else that we have to bring up here and bringing in a little bit of the gameplay here. It's rather difficult to make the game sound the way it does on the soundtrack. And actually, I appreciate yeah. the fact that the soundtrack exists because when you try to yeah. play this game, how how would you describe the experience? It, it's very stilted from Parappa, even when you're doing it well. Um, because, I mean, think of how early this is in the, the rhythm genre era. Uh, we think ahead to games like Guitar Hero and Rock Band, and they do a lot of predictive stuff in those games. Like if you're playing well, they'll actually play the next notes correctly, even if you miss them, because it's coming so fast. And then once it realizes you've missed the note, it gives you that little like kind of sound on it. Um, <laughs> they, they weren't at that point back here in Parappa. So it's... The skunk over here will bring you luck. The pup over here comes with the truck. Like it's it doesn't sound as smooth as it does, but it makes sense because they have to break up all of those individual notes and they have to give you that immediate feedback of whether you got it or not. <laughs> right. And, and if you don't get it, it's fun, 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 snow, snow, snow. <laughs> right. Well, that gets into the freestyle side of things. Sure. This leads to tracks 24 through 30. I actually have two favorites in here. Donut's Head is stellar. <laughs> it's kind of like the loading screen music, but very, very groovy. I kind of wish that they expanded on this a little bit more. Also, Sugar Song. Song. Lovely guitar tones in it. Totally overlooked in the game. Yesterday, I actually did uh, a playthrough of Parappa for the first time in a while, and <laughs> it really felt like a lot of these scenes in between I was seeing for the first time. I'm like, do I remember this? <laughs> I think I always just press start. Like, I just want to get to the next song. So a lot of these scenes, I'm like, oh, that, right, that's what's happening here. And they're fun little ditties, but um, yeah, for me, it's always just get to that next song. And that's what we're getting to here. I mean, all right, so he's learned how to fight. Uh, he got his driver's license, crashed the car, needs money. He's still infatuated with this girl and her birthday's coming up, so now he's going to learn how to bake her a birthday cake. Every single day, stress comes in every way. I ain't got no time for nobody. My style is rich, dope, fat, and rich. We'll make a cake today that looks rich. Which brings us to track 31, Cheap Cheap, the Cooking Chicken's Rap. This is one of my least favorite tracks. Yeah, and it's also the song that tends to break people in the game because the the flow on it is very different from some of the prior ones. It sounds like it's going to be similar, but it's really not. And something we haven't talked about because it's more gameplay related is if you don't know the songs intimately, you may not know when it's going to be your turn to do the lines. Uh, yes. Like there, there are bars across the top of the screen, but again, it's so early in the genre. They haven't quite perfected like the... Um, the UI on it to let you know because there's sometimes where you'll sing something two bars later and then most of the time it's four bars later and unless you know that you're going to do that you might miss it and it's also a weird thing where the button presses aren't necessarily every syllable they'll be every word or if it's a short phrase just one button press for the phrase and this is the point where if you don't really know all of that it's going to break you you know I'm going to argue with you on this a little bit because if you play games like Rock Band Guitar Hero or even Dance Dance Revolution is a really good Mm-hmm. example of this you do have to memorize a lot yeah, in yeah. order to do well in these songs parappa doesn't really shouldn't really get too much flack for that even though it is really infuriating the first time you play it because it should be more obvious i disagree with your disagreement i think it's all on the ui here i think it, it wasn't quite where it needed to be yeah that's fair now about cheap cheap the cooking chicken herself she is played by michelle burks i think she does a fine job also worth mentioning that the music in the background very new jack swing beat yep. in comparison to the other tracks that either they're more reggae or more funk this one definitely sticks to the main theme more i actually do love this lyric even though i'm not a huge fan of the stage of the song the other day i was called a little turkey but i'm a chicken got it you beef jerky (laughs) sure so great that is so clever maybe i would toss the song for everything else but that lyric alone is fantastic one thing i want to talk about uh about this level and actually goes to your point about the soundtrack is when you start playing this level it looks like parappa's watching a television show about how to cook and the the vocal delivery is as if you're hearing someone else watching tv like it's not a, a clear lyric what's actually happening is if you start rapping poorly Parap is actually standing on set next to the cook and she will walk away from the video camera over to where Parappa is and then the vocal comes into full clarity there, in the oven for a while. Leave it there. come on clean the pot. 
style. Leave it there. Come on, clean the pie. Put the cake in the oven for a while. Put the cake in the oven for a while. Again, I think that's perfect video game stuff. And I also appreciate that the soundtrack is that full in front of you vocal quality the whole time. Yeah, pretty fantastic. We then get some more environmental music with tracks 32 and 33. And then we go to 34, which is called the Love You Rap. Now, from what I recall, Mike, this is actually a song that just plays on the radio while things are happening in the game, right? It is. All right. <laughs> to put it in context a little bit. So uh, Parappa and Sonny and all the friends that go out in a picnic and some of the friends are smart enough to be like, hey, let's leave them alone a little bit. There's the one thing is a bear that wants to eat everything that literally has to be dragged away from the food. Um, and this kind of sets up what's going to happen in the next song, which is one of the best songs in the history of all songwriting. But so they're left alone. And then Parappa's is like, oh, God, my stomach. I really got to go to the bathroom. And so he's getting all these weird visions in his head. And so and <laughs> incidentally enough, Sonny's looking at him like, oh, he looks really manly right now. And actually, he's just like, oh, God, I got to go to the bathroom. <laughs> he looks all serious, but that's not is what's happening here. Uh, so, yeah, they get in his car. She's He's going to drive her home. And this weird song just starts playing on the radio that almost feels like it's taunting him about needing to go to the bathroom. Like the, the lyrical suggestions. It's not quite a love song. It's really bizarre. But that's the setup for this. Now Parappa is driving her home, but he's got to stop. Not just because he's running out of gas, which he is, but he has to go to the bathroom. I need to go, just as bad as you. What I had this morning, I don't even want to say to you. Kick, punch, turn, and chop the door. Kick, punch, turn, and chop the door. All right, we move on to track 38, which is the All Masters rap. Parappa is really needing to go to the bathroom. He ends up finding a was a porta potty or a bathroom somewhere, Mike. Yeah, it's a bathroom behind the gas station that he stops at. And for some reason, all of his previous rap masters are all also there waiting in line to use the bathroom. Quote unquote, for some reason, yeah. Right. You said and you said this is one of your favorite songs. It is. I because what I love about it is they you were mentioning earlier, you love the main theme and how they incorporate that that main theme, the motif into other bits and pieces throughout the soundtrack. What I love about this song is, well, I mean, the song about going to the bathroom is just amazing. But two, it's that they incorporate the flow and the lyrics from all of the previous songs into this song. And I love that. It just feels like a cohesive whole or real world. Of course, it's just silly you know, paper thin cartoon characters, but it really feels like a fully realized world that they put together here. I have to bring up, speaking of that, one of the greatest coincidences. It's a song about waiting in line for the bathroom. The sample that's being played in the background is from Three Dog Night. The name of the song, Shades of Brown. Uh, Lyrically, there are some really good moments, but Mike, I am a chicken from the kitchen and I ain't kidding, although nothing is written. Yeah, I mean... Watabe has done an amazing job with most of this. This one is really pushing it. (laughs) All right, to be fair, in the same song, we also have... In the rain or in the snow, I got the funky flow, but now I really got to (laughs) go. That, that, however, that's gold right there. His particular lines. My God, he was going to use the toilet, but he already sold it. (laughs) Right. (laughs) So good. All right. We move on to tracks 39 40. Again, more environmental music. I don't have anything really to spotlight here. But what happens next, Mike? You know, Parappa's going to this uh, concert party thing and he's inviting the girl along and, you know, we're just going to have a big party, big show. Indeed. Parappa's on stage as well. He is. uh, Would you say he's he's flexing well to get his girl at this point? (laughs) I would say so. Yeah, he's trying to do what he can do because she has not been impressed with his normal self so far. I think we could get into a larger conversation there about, you know, be yourself. Don't don't feel like you need to be something for somebody else. But, uh, you know, he still wants to go for it. And uh, this is how he's going to do it. I think the background music, which isn't a direct sample, this is more of an interpolation. So yeah, they base yeah. it off of something else and just change the melody a little bit. But if it sounds familiar to you, it's probably because you've heard the song "Oh What a Night," the real title, December 1963 from the Four Seasons. Do, 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 do. I think it actually yep. works really well with this inspirational tone, pulling from gospel a little bit with how it's trying to uplift. And Dread Fox here, who has been Parappa this whole time, by the way, mm-hmm. saying "I gotta believe," makes perfect sense. I 
honestly, I don't have much interest in the song. It's not something that really speaks to me all that much. Not too much drama here. It's just very uplifting, but that's pretty much all it does. I think it's kind of surface level in that degree. Yeah, I agree. The other stuff had some kind of shtick to it. This just feels like a big festival party song, celebratory, where at the end, everyone's happy. Yeah, there's really nothing else to it. I don't think it has much of an identity to it beyond that. Yep, agreed. Moving on to the last three tracks here, one of them being Katie and Sunny funny band anthem it's so dated but i actually found this to be a lot of fun yeah it's all cute stuff agreed and lastly uh the last track of the soundtrack is funny love which shows up before the last major song of the soundtrack right right. uh, in the game that is but here i actually enjoy the chorus because again reprising the main theme Mm -hmm. but also with this really nice vocal that runs throughout just you and i I think what they tried to do here, and I say this because they've done it with, I believe, the next game, Um, Jammer, Lammy. Mm-hmm. I think also with Parappa 2. The last song on the soundtrack is supposed to be the single that they mm. would make specifically yeah, yeah. to advertise the game, basically, but also to try and hit the charts. And I think it's it's respectable. I think it's a kind of an enjoyable song. But, you know, the verses kind of lose me a little bit. Pretty good finisher, I'd say. It's fine. I really, <laughs> once I hit the uh, King Kong Muji song, I feel like I'm pretty much done. So, Jeff, we've come to the end of the game, the end of the soundtrack. Maybe people have played it. We can talk about um, what the availability on the game is. But if people want to check out the music, hey, they can uh, do nothing. Yeah, pretty much. I can't find it anywhere. It's not on Apple Music. I've seen playlists with it on Spotify, but I don't think they're available in the U.S. So Mm. if you're international in Japan, I'm sure you've got plenty of options here in the U.S. uh, Go to YouTube. (laughs) I know. I hate to suggest that, but there's really not much else you can do. Uh, I don't remember this, but I was reading that apparently for a short period of time in conjunction with the PSP release, I guess Sony put out the soundtrack for free. So technically, maybe I guess those are legal files. So that'll help you sleep at night whatever yeah uh good luck enjoy <laughs> which is it you know it's fascinating mike because they have redone this game basically every 10 years the game came out in 1996 yep. in 2007 there was the psp release and then 2017 they did the remaster for the ps4 yep yep and yet no soundtrack i know to go right? with it. i mean there is a soundtrack which is what we're listening to but again yeah that's just the japanese soundtrack release well let's talk about the reception of this game released in december of 1996 as we said released in north america the next november would rank the seventh best-selling game in japan in 1997 and would win sony's platinum prize in may 1998 for passing one million copies sold in japan alone that is a huge number the game did remarkably well i think the demo also really brought a lot of interest to players in the U.S. It did. I want you to read this quote from Next Generation Magazine, see what they had to say about the game. Yeah, so the review from Next Gen at the time, the game is so well produced and carried out that you won't even notice that the gameplay itself is based on the most primitive concepts. Simply put, style over substance has never been better done than in Parappa. I think that's so funny, like the most primitive of concepts, like what, pressing buttons? I I suppose so, but it, it was inventing something new and people didn't really realize that at the time. Okay. Okay, before we move forward, though, we do have negatives with this album. You're not going to get much if you're not playing the game. The circus music is really going to drive you away. It drove me crazy. Mike, I texted you this. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, even if you're just listening to the main raps, there's... (laughs) Without playing the game and having the attachment to the game, they're really corny songs. They're really basic songs. They've got really fun beats to them that you can kind of groove along to, but it's fine. But I, without having played the game, I don't know that I'd listen to it. It would just be this fun curiosity. Disagreeing with you on one track, Mussolini's track. That okay. one, that's a <laughs> banger. That is a banger. All right. Fair enough. All right. Very true. It's not the point. You know, it's a kid's game, obviously. I wouldn't say this game's aged very well, wouldn't you say, Mike? In a lot of ways. I mean, the uh, going back to what I was talking about with the, the button presses, I mean, it's it's hard to know. Like, do I press it as it goes over the thing? Do I press it in time with the music? Um, there's an interview that I think you're going to link with the episode where they actually talk about the, the input timing, how it was loose earlier on, and then they tightened it because they wanted some drama and some tension to it. I still don't feel like it's quite right. And that goes into the current re-release of the game 
game, which we'll talk about a little bit. But in those respects, yeah, like, uh, kind of had to be there in 1997 to see what they were doing in terms of the gameplay here. So like you mentioned earlier, there are three versions of the game. This is the original PS1 version. They did a re-release on PSP. In that time, we moved from CRTs to LCD screens, OLED screens, you know, all sorts of other types of displays that inherently have some kind of input lag or delay to them. Uh, on the PSP, that was like a known quantity. There was only, well, I mean, there were multiple models of the PS3, but it was like a single console. So they, if they wanted to, they could adjust the timing to just that model of that system. And, and maybe that could work. But then there's the PS4 release. Everyone's got different AV systems. Everyone's got different TVs. The PS4 version is actually just the PSP version running in an emulator within their own custom emulator. Um, no additional work on the timing there. And because it's just that game, there's no delay, input, timing, sliders, adjustments, things that we had already come to be uh, used to and accustomed to and grateful for. So like the most widely available version of the game, I can't recommend that people check out, unfortunately. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that because uh, especially when you told me there was no calibration check. Yeah. Yeah, you lost me because I mean, it just it's going to hamper the gameplay experience. And I think back when the game originally came out, that's excusable because it's the first one and people are getting used to it. Nowadays, you really can't get away with that anymore. Yeah, I had to. I mean, I still have all my systems hooked up. So I just went upstairs and played the PS1 game on a CRT and it was fine. Best way to experience the game, I'd say. Yep. After the initial success of Parappa the Rapper, Nana Uncha came back with spin-off Um Jammer Lammy in 1999. Features the same art style by Rodney Greenblatt and is technically a spiritual successor to Parappa. It's also technically in the same universe because when you complete the main storyline, you can actually unlock a side story with Parappa. Yep, Very yep. interesting. There was also a sequel released, Parappa the Rapper 2, which uh, 2004, I believe. Yeah, it's, it's on the PS2. I own it. And as much as I love Parappa 1, I'm not convinced I have ever popped that game in my PS2. No kidding. That's so bizarre to me. I guess I'm going to have to do that after we're done recording. After Um Jammer Lammy, Nana Unsha goes in a completely different direction. Masaya Matsura had a simple concept for it. Allow the player to play the game to their own music collection. There was no way he could have predicted the cult following this game would earn after its release and how its strange music would inspire fans decades afterwards. Let's move on to our review of the songs from Nana Unsha's cult classic rhythm game from 1999, Vibrip. Thank you play as Vibri, a white geometric rabbit prancing along a jittery white line against an empty black background. Obstacles begin to approach you in the form of a circle, a square, a set of waves, or a V-shaped pit, or a combination of these, and it's your job to hop over or roll through them using specific buttons on your controller. There's nothing more to it than that. Oh, except for all the random tempo changes that cause obstacles to both crawl towards you and crash into you at the same time. Nana Onsha originally developed the game to be devoid of style or genre, with the player given the ability to put in their own CDs. The game would create levels based on the music you put in, but that alone wasn't much of a selling point, so Nana Onsha collaborated with J-pop band Laugh and Peace to produce songs that would provide the game with built-in levels. Featuring the vocals of Yoko Fujita, the duo was given one specific direction for their songwriting, don't give the player any impression of a particular genre or style. The result is six tracks that still, to this day, defy conventions of genre and style, and its ramping tempos are vastly unlike the overwhelming majority of music today. We will get to a track by track review of the music from this game. However, there's a lot of information we have to go through first because this game has quite a history. Before we get to that history though, Mike, tell me, how did you learn about Vib Ribbon? So my introduction to Vib Ribbon, as far as I know, was in 2001 at the Otakon Anime Music Video Contest when there was a video from New Wave, I believe it is, uh, using what was called then Medium Stage 2 uh, in a music video to 
the uh, the anime series FLCL. And the song just immediately got in my head, I think, a lot of other folks' head. So it was a couple years late at that point. I'm trying to remember if I had heard of the game. Maybe they're getting into college, just like you, uh, college in 2000 there. So access to a wide range of other folks and, and, and items. Or was that my first introduction? And then I'm wondering if I didn't actually play the game, I think, until you brought it to some party somewhere. Yeah, that may be the case. And it's important that we bring this up as we talk about our stories here. This game never came to the U.S. when it originally came out. It was released in Japan, of course, and released in Europe. The U.S. never got it. Yeah, it got a full English localization just in Europe, and they never brought it out over here. And part of this was Sony had some weird mandates in America at the time where they were turning down a lot of 2D games, a lot of experimental games. They really wanted that focus on the the full price giant polygonal experiences. Uh, and it's a shame because then stuff like this flew under the radar and didn't come out here officially. So many years later, when was it Sean Layden, I think, there at uh, Sony mentioned it on stage at a press conference over here in America, and everyone's like, what are you talking about we never got this game what what and he <laughs> apologized and said he didn't realize it never came out in america and that's actually what led to us finally getting a release on psn for uh ps3 and you could transfer it to psp and vita as well uh the ps1 classic there that's so weird those chain of events that finally got us and it's just the european rom that they put up it's not like they fixed it for <laughs> i say fixed it it's, that's what they put up in such a bizarre history to this game yeah, definitely bizarre. Though I will say my history with it, considering that I had friends with a modded PS1, you can imagine not just Parappa the Rapper being one of those games that I would see, but also Vib Ribbon. They had a copy of it. I was able to play it. Uh, I think it was a year or two after it came out. 2001 is when mm. I played it. Yeah. And instantly hooked to the soundtrack right up my alley. And that's it. That's all there is to my story. It's just that I saw it in 2001, fell in love with it. Playing your own music to it was a rather remarkable thing. And I actually want to go into that a little bit because from a technical standpoint, this game is just impressive because, I mean, you could say that, well, you know, what is there to it besides just a white rabbit on top of a black background? But you have to understand that this game is so small in terms of its size that it could fit into the RAM of the PlayStation 1. Right. So so that you could take the game disc out and put your own music into it. That is crazy. Yeah, there was some other stuff that was doing it at the time. Like I think Ridge Racer, you could like the, the you could actually race and the tracks would play and then you could put in your own game disc and it would just play like track one, whatever was on the, the CD there. And then you'd have to put it back in to keep playing stuff. But this is a game that's built around that concept. Yeah, it's got its own built in levels. And that's primarily what we're going to talk about. But this predates things. I mean, I think you and I were big into Amplitude for a while on PC predates that by decades. Yeah, exactly. All right. Next up, let's talk about Laugh and Peace. Uh, and I say that, but there's really not much to mention because looking I was up. I going to say, did you come up with anything to say? Because I got nothing, man. Yeah, let me let me just bring up what I know about them. And again, people, listen, if you know anything about Laugh and Peace, if you happen to be in Japan and you know much more than we do about it, comment on this episode. You've got plenty of ways to do that. YouTube comments, go to our subreddit, send us an email. We need to know more about this group because there is so little there is to read about them. But what I know is that Laugh and Peace, also known as Kiyoki, also known as Unko Star, is a group comprised of two members, Koichi Hirota and Toshiyuki Kageyama. Though you may also see them with the monikers Big Ben and Gary. Have no idea where <laughs> they ever appear. I just saw that somewhere. So we're up to what? Is that, is that five names, I think? Uh, it gets worse. <laughs> <laughs> there is very little information to find on them pre-1999. It's very possible they were an album production team on par with things like the Neptunes or Terry Jan uh, Lewis. Okay, like studio artists, productions. Got it, got it. Exactly. But even if you try searching for them as producers, you're going to find few results, right? What I want to know is what is it about them that Matsura saw or heard yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. that made him think, let's get these guys on board? Because pre-1999, it is so hard to see any reason why they would be involved in the first place. I'm really curious to hear about that. Okay, so what about required listening? Is there any required listening to this? Uh, not really. I mean, according to Matsura, that's kind of by design. In fact, during the original production, there was supposed to be colors and graphics. However, Matsura feared it sets off a specific world of music to the players. And that's a direct quote. So he identified right away that if you give them style then you're attributing that to appropriate music that you can play in the game. If you leave it empty, then technically anything is suitable for the game. And I think that's really clever. But 
I think there's a bit of a lie there because technically the look of Vib Ribbon came from their development of an ad for Mercedes Benz that got mm. scrapped because the car got scrapped. You could say that their intention became to make things minimal, but you could also say that, well, that's just a product of the prototype that they built for Mercedes Benz and then just adapted it. It's a little bit of a conflict there, but I do find it interesting that it ends up being so empty and that allows you to put whatever music into it and have it be appropriate. It works. Let's put it that way. I do have maybe one bit of required listening and it's it's a vocal delivery style comparison. Um, and I mean, I'm coming to it just knowing one song primarily, but it's the the Japanese band Judy and Mary. If you remember the first opening theme to the Roroni Kenshin uh, television series, it's just kind of that I'm really hesitant to describe it this way because it, it sounds disparaging, but it's like that kind of like yelping female vocal style. You're going to hear a lot of that in these tracks as well well where it's not necessarily in tune but it but it is in tune and there's a melody to it uh that that was like the only thing i could come up with and judy and mary was early 90s and continued onward as well so it's kind of contemporary there God, Mike, what a perfect suggestion. In the background, I'm going to put in the track Music Fighter. Mm. What a great example of this. And yes, you're absolutely right. If there is anything that could be seen as an influence, yeah, Judy and Mary is that crazy. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) So definitely worth listening to. Okay, one more thing before we get into our track by track review here. What version are we listening to? (laughs) (laughs) I'm playing the game, Jeff. I don't know what you're doing. Right. Let me describe the different ways you could listen to Vib Ribbon. Okay, the first thing you can do is you can take the actual PS1 game, stick it in a CD player or in a computer, and then technically you could rip off the tracks because the way that PlayStation 1 games tended to work is they would have the data side and the audio side. And the audio side would have the actual soundtrack on it, and some games did have this capability, Vib Ribbon being one of them. Yeah, this was called Red Book Audio, and so track one, if you listen to that, it's just gonna it's just gonna be garbage. Uh, but beyond that, yeah, they're just regular CD audio tracks. Tracks. Okay, other than that, there's also an official soundtrack that was released after the sequel game Vib Ripple came out in 2004. So it's a combination soundtrack, and uh, that is pretty much the only audio release that we have. And this is a Japanese CD. You're not going to find it on streaming services. We on this episode are going to stick to the track order from the PlayStation 1 game disc. Yep. Now, that leads to a problem, though. <laughs> Yes, Jeff, what is the the name of that song again? Right, about the track names. So (laughs) we're going to refer to the tracks as their Japanese name, the the official names as they are supposed to be named, but also the English track titles that we have lovingly referred to them as for decades at this point. And what's the story behind that? Well, there's this thing called the CD database. It's called Grace Note nowadays, but the CD database is essentially this database that apps would connect to get song titles when you put a CD into a computer because CDs themselves don't have this information built into them. They they didn't have the capability of storing metadata. So when you put it in a CD player, it's a track one, track two, you've no idea what you're listening to. But devices that had internet connection and could connect to the CDDB would be able to pull track names and metadata. Now, the first time you do this, however... Because CDDB wasn't connected to anything commercial, it didn't know anything about the CDs you would put in if it was the first time seeing them. So you were able to write the information about it. And what I think is someone who got the game, put this in their computer, saw nothing. And also this is technically Nana Uncha's fault because nowhere that I could find in the game disc, in the instructions, nor in the press materials, did they ever give these tracks names. So this person who put the CD in for the first time, named it themselves, uploaded it to CDDB, essentially influenced all of our naming conventions from that point forward in any English speaking country. That's probably the best explanation (laughs) that anyone can come up with. (laughs) It's so strange. So many things are strange about this game. Yeah. What we are going to do is we are going to stick to both Japanese and English or colloquial titles, I guess, English colloquial titles. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, we're probably going to refer to them in the English titles more so. But yeah, do know that there are official track titles that have been taken from the 2004 official soundtrack. So we're going to refer to them as that as well. That out of the way, thematic elements. We cannot start going track by track without addressing the ramping tempos. Mm -hmm. If there is one thing that sets Vib Ribbon apart from other soundtracks, it is that every track by Laugh and Peace 
has these tempo changes. And that is strategic. It's for the game. It's basically because you're getting these obstacles thrown at you. It would be kind of boring if the tempo didn't change and Vibri kept dancing at the same pace along the line. You have to throw in these different tempos all over the place because it makes it more difficult to play. But it in turn makes the music so much more interesting as a result. And we're definitely going to get into more specific examples of how that comes across as we go track by track here. But apart from that, there's a lot of sound effects. Again, we see samples just like with Parappa sampling other music. We're going to see samples here as well. Beats are very cut and paste in places, so it's uh, very off kilter. And Mike, what do you want to say about Yoko Fujita's vocal here? Uh, Acquired taste, but also adorable and endearing, but also maybe you don't want to listen to it. I don't know. (laughs) I think it depends, right? Well, let's go right into what we're going to call track one, which is the Vib Ribbon opening music by Masaya Matsura. It starts with this beautiful harp sweep. We get this orchestral tension and then... (laughs) yeah adorable little Vibri and her <laughs> synthesized voice. And then do, 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 do. <laughs> so cute. It's so weird. And I, I can listen to it for a couple minutes before I get sick of it. <laughs> But I mention it because I think that contrast between the orchestration and this digital synthesized voice is a very good indicator of where we're going with this. Yeah, yeah. Because it is so out there, so different. That will bring us to the first of the Laugh and Peace songs, which is the first track of what's called the Bronze Stage. And just to introduce that real quick, Vib Ribbon has three stages, bronze, silver, and gold. And each stage has two tracks. So you can kind of assume by how it sounds that you've got the easy, medium, and hard difficulty levels here. And we're going to start with the Bronze Stage, the easy levels, starting with in Japanese, Tech 2, walking, or as we lovingly refer to it, Polaroid. I think as an introduction, it works. It's very slow in tempo, has Mm -hmm. punctuated beats. So for the player, it makes it easy to get accustomed to the style of gameplay, which is just simply pressing buttons when a certain pit or obstacle comes your way. I don't know about you, Mike, but I actually found the song to be boring for a while. Yeah, I mean, it it feels that way. It's such an introductory track. And even its tempo changes are like baby's first tempo changes just to get you kind of (laughs) literally rolling along with the song. But then, Jeff, when you listen to it, ready for birth, ready for death, there's no answer anytime, any place. Oh my God, this is a song about depression. Yeah. I mean, these lyrics are incredible. They're so vivid without being obligatory. And I would never expect it. Not to mention that they're sung in loose English. Yeah. I mean, I would say what, like two thirds of the songs are English and then you start getting into English and Japanese and then just Japanese. Yeah. And for the most part, the English is pretty good. There's only a couple songs. I'm like, "Ah, I see what you're doing there. Uh, I forget exactly which song it is. It's the word just where we say, man, I just don't feel well today. Like uh, an an accent like that in the middle of a sentence, a non-native speaker would put the word just in a different part of the sentence. So there's stuff like that throughout the lyrics. But yeah, I feel like when you're playing the game, you're distracted from just literally just learning how to play the game at that point, that you're not necessarily hearing the lyrics. They're almost used as an accent or an instrument themselves in the song. Also, to your point, we don't have the translation alliteration skills of Ryu Watabe here. It's yeah, just yeah. laugh in peace. And mm-hmm. so we and so those weird phrasings are just something that, you know, we in America think are awkward, but it sounds okay in terms of how they appear mm-hmm. here. Another thing, Mike, I have to go back to one of the funniest comments you've ever told me about, which is the sound effects from Living Through Another Cuba for by XTC. Oh yes. <laughs> Same thing here. Sound effects, they drive me nuts. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously we have the Polaroid camera going off, but uh I think what sounds like a photocopier is in there too. Mm -hmm. Uh, Again, great opening, great intro, but that is going to bring us to the Japanese edition. The title is Oops, (laughs) English, Sunny Day.
Now, how interesting that we go from this somewhat depressing song, slow, but we get into a romantic flavor with this song. We do. It really makes me think about how they conceive these songs if they actually conceive them linearly, because it feels like it is telling a story along the way, because this is where we're starting to come out of that depression to see what else there is in the world and other feelings you can have. Yeah, and it's really motivating. I mean, the lyric here that I have is, there's no time, hurry up. Everything's so fantastic. There's no time, hurry up. There will be someone. Yeah. It's so sweet. And the chorus has this very yearning feel to it because the melody is sweet, but it never really resolves until the very end. The the verses do have that resolve, but the way that they construct these melodies and the fact that there's like... Um, these very interesting synth notes in places, the decorations on the track. It's really very sweet. I think it's actually one of my favorites on the set of songs. Fujita's vocal, occasionally she's off tune, yes. Mm -hmm. But I, th I think that's part of the delivery, and it's part of the emotion and the, and the storytelling of the song. Uh, and I actually want to dip back a little bit. We said the first the first song, um, Polaroid there, as we call it, uh, is a, a really depressing song about depression. But at the very end of the song, they actually get out of their rut a little bit here, uh, and they do into the song as well. This is kind of a trite comparison, but it actually reminds me a little bit of Adam's song by Blink-182, where it sounds like it's a song about suicide but it, by the time you get to the end of the song you actually the the author the character realizes no there actually is more to the world i do want to spend time in my room alone that's okay i do actually want to know love and appreciate my family and friends and i feel this is just a little more artistic version of that not so literal and on the nose yeah, but you know what, though? That's what I think is really remarkable about this, because that song doesn't have a ramping tempo. Mm. And, and you know, obviously being conventional, it wouldn't do that. Yeah, yeah. And that sort of thing, though, works really well here because it the does. lyrics yeah, yeah. say there's no time. Hurry up, especially mm -hmm. at the end where it gets so quick and they're saying, hurry up, hurry up. It, just again, delivering that point that time goes quickly, that you should just seize the moment. Really well done here. Now, let's shift the mood a bit. We're going to go to the next song, which <laughs> in Japanese, Shiteru, because the... Uh, the translated title here roughly translates to do you know in the english speaking countries we refer to it as laugh and beats <laughs> There is, there's a lot to say about this song. It starts off the first track of the Silver Stage. So uh, this is a medium difficulty. And boy, what a track to do that because it is all over the place. I don't think there's very much orchestrated here. I think this is mostly built out of samples, but it's just so confident. It's got this boisterous tone to it. Like yeah, it, yeah. you have to, if you're going to go crazy, you have to be confident about it in order to pull this off. They announced it right from the beginning. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, like, here we go. That will bring us to the samples that are being used. And I found five of the samples being used here. The first one here, you'll instantly recognize. Mike, you've said it before. It is... Here's where it's from. Ladies and gentlemen, what you're about to witness is the witness of the business, and you must hear this. There's a German record label called Master Bits. They basically release sampling software, they release sample collections, and they have this collection called Climax 9 Rhapsody Vocals 2. It's uh, basically just a CD of all these different vocal samples. They had a bunch of rappers come into a studio and sound, it sounds like, and just ad lib everything. Mm, yeah. And so this is one of the tracks on that sample CD. Slow down, pitch down to give it that weird effect in the Laugh and Beats song. Now, in addition to that, we have this sample that you might recognize. Yo, the beats are strong. Yo, the beats are strong, but the night is long. And here's where that came from. Yo, the beats are strong, but the night is long, and you gotta keep it going. Another track on this uh, same CD collection from Master Bits. Here's where that comes from. Here's 
Here's another one. So the shouting at the end of the track. And the Don't Stop Now sample. This comes from a sample collection by Cold Cut, and this is from their Kleptomania series. Don't stop now. This cut and paste feel that's in this track sounds crazy, and it's coming from these different sources, but mostly coming from Master Bits, of course. Now, what's interesting about Master Bits, though, is that this collection of samples has actually been used in other video game soundtracks, including Einhander, which is uh, one of the most notable, one of the additional soundtracks for Street Fighter Three. Buster Groove, and Ape Escape. These soundtracks have actually used the same sample collection. So it all just contributes to this overall messiness that I think is so incredible about this track. <laughs> the word objective has no meaning anymore. But if I'm being objective about this uh, the soundtrack, I think this is probably my favorite song. I, we're going to have a fight over the next song. <laughs> but um, uh, I, I really, really love it. Uh, this is going to tie into some, I, I think, of my suggested additional listening later on. But this reminds me so much of anything Hideki Naganuma does um, for the Jet Set Radio games. Uh, it just fits in so well there. It's just funky. It's got flow. I love the samples. So you could really transport this into that game or any of that game's music into this game. <laughs> and I think it would work well. Oh my god, I gotta do that. I gotta go pop in the Jet Set soundtrack in the Vib Ribbon. Oh my god, why have I never done that? <laughs> That's a great idea. Yeah, definitely. All right, let me pull it back into the subjective for a second here. Because would this song be the same if it didn't go crazy slow and crazy crazy fast. I think it would be fine, but the identity of all of these songs is the changing of the tempos. And I love the don't stop now. And it's so good. <laughs> the way that the, the tune and the pitch is, is worked into the samples as a whole, but also into the speed changes. I just love it so much. Yeah, this is really where I think my appreciation of this slow and fast dichotomy is just something you don't hear. And I really wish I would hear it more because this is the kind of thing where it's more than just music being something that you want to dance to. You really can't dance to something where the tempo keeps going nuts. Yeah. yeah. But at the same time, you're getting so much dramatic effect out of it. Yes, this is a song that doesn't have like any lyrical meaning to it. It's just basically a collection of samples. But at the same time, I mean, it's so jubilant that it is hard to deny how fascinating and how engaging the song is. So I agree with you, Mike. It's actually my, one of my favorites, if not my favorite, of this entire collection of songs. Next track, the Japanese edition. It is called Hot Play, as we know it, Universal Dance. This is the song that I was introduced to from the AMV contest at Otakon that year in 2001. I, I can maybe agree with you a little bit on in a bubble without that introduction. Maybe it's not the most exciting. I don't know. I think some of the tracks that will follow, I feel more that way about. I am not one for the word nostalgia or the feeling of nostalgia. I don't have much of it. And I think it's kind of a dangerous thing at times. But when I hear this song, my nostalgia tingles go off. So it's really hard to strip that away um, from my feelings on the song. I don't blame you on that. I think the only reason why I feel it's a low point, it actually really ties into the gameplay, I think, more so because the beginning of this level, it is just pit after pit after pit after pit. And remember, there are four different symbols that show up on this line. I'm so bad at this game and this track. <laughs> is really? Not, <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like I... I just can't, I can never remember where the buttons are for, for each item. Even after all these years, I still can't do it. And the combination and oh, just. That's so funny because I've mastered this game. Are you kidding? Like this is, <laughs> and, and this one, it's because it's not only that you have to press the buttons at specific times, but that you actually get extra points by ad living in the middle. And this is very yeah, yeah. much calling back to Parappa, where mm -hmm. if you yep, did yep. some freestyling, you would get extra points. Although there, you couldn't really tell where you were supposed to freestyle. And here it's a lot more free form. That's why I'd say it's more of a low point because the the tempo doesn't change as significantly here it, it at least in places where yoko is singing that's why i feel it's a little bit more 
conventional. Not to say much that it takes away from my enjoyment of the song. I still think it's pretty great. But in terms of comparison against these other Laugh and Peace songs, I do feel like it's the only one that feels a bit more conventional and therefore takes away some of the enjoyment for me. <sighs> Again, it's so hard for me to strip away my feelings from it. It's also got like a little bit of that punk flair to it. So I'm attracted to it that way. I, I like the the short yelps in in the lyrics. Um, again, the lyrics are what they are on this song. It's it's totally fine. But um, well, let me actually jump in there too because the guitars are shredding here. It's so great to hear. I think the chorus is really great with exactly those noises. There's like this whooshing sound going between the ears here. Mm-hmm. I do want to pull out, I guess, one little bit of the lyrics here. Sunny day, rainy day, every day, got a kick, got a hook, you got to move on. I, I think this is where they've not only moved out of the depression and into the you know sunny, the sunny day, so to speak, but they've come to grips like this is just what life is and you just got to do it and it's going to be all right. Let's move on to trip out or as we know it, overflowing emotions. I always like to have a, a merry story, marry my wife <laughs> every time I'm listening to something because there's always a comment from the peanut gallery and I, I think it just it it puts these songs in perspective from someone else. This was the song where I was listening to it a little bit, and uh, it gets into the the real crazy sped up lyrics, and she just goes, "This is awful." <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, what was it about it? I don't know. I think it was just that you, you get to the point where you're not the one who's actively listening to it and you're just hearing it from afar and the tempo changes are everywhere and the lyrics are blah, 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 blah. It's just, oh God, what is happening up there? What is he doing? I guess we can also say this is a song where we transition into some Japanese lyrics as well. That there's some English or English in there, um, but the majority of the verses are in Japanese. Yeah, and I think that it, I wouldn't say that it takes away from the experience necessarily. I think it just fits the overall tone. Yeah, yeah. But also the choruses here are manic in comparison yes. to. Yeah. Yeah, the cor- the verses, and not only that, but there's that random slowdown in the second chorus that I think is really interesting because, as a dramatic effect, something that again I would love to see this more often, where you set a pattern, but then you mess with that pattern mm-hmm. in further down the line. They play through the chorus all the way in the same tempo. It's really quick, really fast paced. But then in the second chorus, they slow down just at that dramatic moment, which I think is really effective. That's my favorite thing about the song is just that. I can't say, though, that there's really much to the tempo here as there are in other tracks besides those uh, moments, because unlike Laugh and Peace, where it is ramping crazily up and down, uh, it's not as basic sounding as, like, for example, Universal Dance. But here it's still controlled, but it's got some moments where it kicks in and it's actually really engaging. I, I think it's interesting how the changes within the changes are off tempo from the sped up off tempo. I, I think that gives it a, a unique feel to it. But. This is where I start going, well, I really only want to listen to the first four real songs. Mm, I can see that. Yeah. You shared your story with the song, Mike. I have my own. I got to share. Okay. So in researching, I came across this track on SoundCloud, had the title Overflowing Emotions Fixed. And basically what this guy did was he just edited the song. He took the chorus the first time and edited it over the second one. And where it slowed down in the verses, he pulled from other places in the other verses. So it was all one standard tempo. This is the best part. In the comments of the song, all, not most, all of the hate comments were, what do you mean fixed? <laughs> Don't fix these songs. There is no reason to take out the ramping tempos. That to me is exactly why I want to listen to it. I totally see that. Fixed. What do you mean, fix? That's so good. (laughs) Next track, Going On, on the official soundtrack, or to us, Roll Along.
would say this is where the tempo ramping is the most gratuitous because this would be like a normal J-Rock song otherwise. Yeah, it's so weird, especially as being the final of... This is the, the second hard track, right? It, to me, it just sounds like a literal stroll in the park. And yeah, it does the, the tempo stuff. But this one is, I to me, I really feel like this is the weakest track out of the bunch. Oh, interesting, because I don't see it as the weakest. Uh, but you bring up a good point. I should mention we are now in the gold stage. The previous track in this track are the hardest of all the tracks in the game. Unlike where the ramping happens in Tech Squared or Shiteru, or where it's specifically placed in tracks Oops and Trip Out, here it's obligatory. And I wouldn't yeah. say that it's a bad thing necessarily. It, I think it's more interesting in the game than it is here as a soundtrack. Yeah, I agree. And you know what, Mike? I will actually agree with you here that I could see why it's the weakest to you because I would say that the melodicism here and the instrumentation, we've heard it before at this point. It actually kind of sounds like a reprise of some of the themes from multiple songs showing up here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can understand that I even feel this way myself. I just want to hear this as a song because it just sounds like a, a normal kind of just decent song. Well, that is the last of the Laugh and Peace songs. We're going to go back to a track from Matsuda. This one. <laughs> is this a track? I don't know. <laughs> well, I mean, it shows up on the game disc, you know? Yeah, sure, sure. But I mean, it's literally just the how to play the audio from that, that, that you can watch in the game, which is amazing, though. Yeah, it is. I have to say that I think this is really where if you're going to create a fan base over this main character of Vibri, this is the place to do it. Because, this is it. Yeah, yeah. Because it's not just that we hear the what emotion can you pull out of a synthesized voice, right? Uh, but uh, Clearly a lot. Clearly. And I think the way that she's animated, the words that she's saying, like the way that she expresses the obstacles coming her way, the shrieking that you hear when she runs into an <laughs> obstacle. <laughs> But then just like, oh, I'm just playing. Oops, nope. This is actually what you need to do. It's so good. Yeah, it really fantastic. And I think it does really provide a lot of the human quality to this character, even though it's completely synthesized. And in addition to that, we aren't really spotlighting it here, but I really should bring up the what you hear after you finish a level, whether you fail it or you pass it. You get these little songs from Vibri as well. She's singing the points to you and she's either shrieking because you did a terrible job. <laughs> <laughs> or she's singing because she's congratulating you. Just so cute. And in the 2004 soundtrack that came out for Vibribble and Vibribbon, you get to hear these. You don't get to hear them on the game disc. Again, contributing to Vibri as a character, you get more of those little pieces there. I think it's so much fun to listen to, honestly. But that's going to end it for our review of the Vibribbon tracks. There's some things to say about how this game was received, how the soundtrack was received. And the first thing I should say is that it got generally positive reviews when it came out, though it's been labeled a novelty for its short play length. I mean, yeah, yeah. the Laugh and Peace tracks i think total about 11 12 minutes really not much at all it is kind of a kitschy concept you know what? i'm going to defend one thing about it though because people tend to overlook some of the genius that goes into this not just the fact that it's so small that it fits on the ram of a playstation one but also what about those shapes right like the square shape or the pit or the mm -hmm. waves i think people overlook the fact that vibri is dancing on a literal wave mm -hmm. and these symbols represent the forms you would see on a waveform yeah. on an audio waveform mm -hmm. and the combination of things yeah you know you wouldn't see a circle on a waveform necessarily but it's still really clever that this is why Vibri is dancing on the line in the first place she's traveling across a line of sound and it works so well when you put in your own music as well because it's creating these symbols for you as you're playing your own music it's coming up with these levels and another interesting thing about that it's not randomly generated it's an algorithm that sets that's a specific level to that song that you're playing. So you get the same experience every time you play that song. That is just 
fascinating. Yeah, very cool. But I think it goes to the realm of innovation that it becomes kitschy. And I get that. And a lot of reviews certainly brought that out. It did not sell as much as Parappa the Rapper for obvious reasons. I think, uh, especially because it didn't get a US release, it wouldn't be worth the full, you know, whatever $60 price tag you would get on a AAA title game. Even so, that didn't stop a rabid fan base from idolizing Vipri. And that wouldn't become more apparent until social networks came around. Yeah, yeah. And that's where you get the fans who post their love of the game for the world to see like fan art on Twitter, gameplay videos on YouTube. In fact, you can find a massive amount of videos on YouTube, which feature the game's ability to create levels out of popular songs. And you have whole channels devoted to people requesting songs to play in Vibrib and that they then play and record and put back on YouTube. Pretty fascinating. But I think the most credit this game gets with its innovation is where it ends up in 2012, where the New York City Museum of Modern Art establishes a permanent video game collection. In in the first 14 games that were added to that collection alongside Pac-Man, Tetris, The Sims, Myst, and Katamari Damashi is Vib Ribbon. How crazy is that? I mean, it belongs there. Definitely belongs there. I mean, yeah, it's it's effectively a tech demo, uh, you know, a proof of concept, but it, it's absolutely a piece of art in and of itself. So are you looking for a consistent beat to your music? I would say <laughs> stay away from the soundtrack. Are you driving? Do not listen to the soundtrack. Oh, see, I disagree. I actually listen to this driving a lot, to be honest. Maybe it'd be good for like a, a, a jogging, running, walking kind of like dynamic workout a little bit. Like every time it speeds up, you speed up too. And quite honestly, look up the lyrics to this because it's really fascinating how these crazy songs actually can be really profound at times. You never would expect that. Yeah, there's some real depth there. I, I think they're <laughs> they're important songs in that respect. I think there's a lot to say there. Yeah, really, really true. Especially Polaroid, I think, is a great example of that. But for now, we move on to further listening. Mike, start us off. What do you think? Further listening listening for Vib Ribbon. Well, for you, uh, there's, you and I were big into music games. Um, you absolutely mentioned here Beat Mania, the 2DX. Uh, I guess they have some music on there too. Uh, I think just go listen to anything Banami. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good call. The 2DX stuff in particular, I think, because that's where you're going to find some of the, I don't want to say outlandish, but the more um, electronic kind of sounding music from that series. Very true. And also you mentioned earlier Jet Set Radio, worth mentioning here as well. Yeah, I got, oh God, Hideki Naganuma, the Jet Set Radio soundtrack. If you like what you hear here, especially, I think the the perfect track to choose that encompasses both Parappa and Vib Ribbon, uh, Humming the Bass Line, which again, I have a little bit of nostalgia for because there was a Jet Set Radio uh, anime music video project and I did the video for Humming the Bass Line. But that's um, just a fun, funky track. Um, not so much on the tempo changes, but you're going to get the, the funky flow out of that song. And then also from Jet Set Radio, things like Sweet Soul Brother. I mean, it's a little more poppy related. You're going to hear some of that toward the end of Vib Ribbon. But um, is it Let Mom Sleep? I think that's a, a perfect song alongside Laughing Beats or Universal Dance. I think that fits in well there. Um, yeah, just go listen to the Jet Set music. Apart from Beat Mania, like you mentioned, Mike, other things that you might be able to find Laugh and Peace involved in is uh, the work of J-pop artist Ayumi Hamasaki. And she has four singles, it looks like, according to CG Japan, where Laugh and Peace did remixes for her. Oh, nice. And that's really all there is to say about them. I wish I knew more. I'd love to know what they're doing now, what they're working on. If anybody knows anything, again, comment on this episode, send us an email. We would love to know more. I am desperate to know more about Laugh and Peace. It's really fascinating that they are mostly under the radar when it comes to any other work they've done besides Vib Ribbon. Pretty much their name is ubiquitous with Vib Ribbon at this point. Really fascinating. All right, I'm going to take the rest of the further listening here because I've got some things to recommend. Definitely. I'm going to first start by mentioning two artists that on the surface are diametrically opposed to each other in terms of their tone and their lyrical content. However, there is a strange phenomenon that exists with their fan bases. If you happen to be a fan of one, you're more than likely a fan of the other. And these groups are Death Grips and Caro Caro Benito. Death Grips I've mentioned before on episode 16, the extra episode where I reviewed Year of the Snitch. You can hear there that they are uh, whew, violent, uh, crazy, spastic. Um, obviously, I think that a lot of the tone comes from Vib Ribbon in terms of their usage of samples, the shifting tempos. They have them definitely, um, but very, very mature content. I would absolutely not recommend this for anyone under the age of 18 because it is just that spastic. But I hear a lot of similarity between what Flatlander does and the beats to what Laugh and Peace end up doing here on the soundtrack. On the other side of the coin, Caro Caro Benito. Uh, we've got two people working DJs and instruments and the singer up front. She very much reminds me of Yoko Fujita in the way that she has the 
this higher pitched voice atop this kind of electronic background there. Some tracks are very pop focused, some are more dance influenced. They get into a more rocky, punkish direction in their second album, but, but Benito Generation is very much the same kind of pop landscape that Vib Ribbon crosses into. And I think there's definitely some comparison to be made there. Really interesting stuff. But yeah, if you happen to be a fan of one, it's very likely you'll love the other as well. Apart from that, if you want more things like Laugh and Beats or Shiteru, I would recommend listening to The Go Team. Not so much for the ramping tempos here. We're talking about samples, yeah, crazy yeah. instrumentation. Sounds like it was recorded in a garage. It's all there. And I would be very curious to know if anybody in that band has listened or played Vib Ribbon before. I'm sure they have. Last thing, Mike, we're going to take a musical break and listen to this track from a K-pop group, Girls' Generation. They have this track, I Got a Boy, which has been called the Bohemian Rhapsody of K-pop. <laughs> Let me put it down another way. That was Girls' Generation, I Got a Boy. That was released on January 1st, 2013 with the music video. Became an instant hit, which proves my point that you can do this kind of crazy changes in tempo and cut and paste stuff and make it a hit. It can still be popular. I think in their case, it's really fantastic. They have some great harmonics going on with the vocals here. I love the crazy stuff going on in the background. Mike, my favorite thing here, at some point we hear... Don't stop. Let's bring it back to 140. And not only is she talking about let's bring it back to 140 BPM, Mm -hmm. the tempo... Yeah, but also that part of the song is at one minute and forty seconds. Oh, that's so cool! <laughs> Incredible. Also, the other thing that's notable about this, which I think is a funny coincidence, before this song came out, their full album title was "Girls and Peace." Ah, uh, interesting. All right. all right, very, very interesting. All right, that's all I have to say about that. Go check out "I Got a Boy." I'm really excited to share this news, Mike, because I've kind of been holding on to it. I didn't want to mention it during our review or during any of the initial information of Vib Ribbon, but. I have to tell you, I'm so excited because we are recording right now, July of 2020. This record company in Great Britain called Minimum Records, they put out a link in May of this year to pre-order a vinyl edition of Vib Ribbon soundtrack by itself to be released at the end of July. I pre-ordered this thing so damn fast. Thanks to you, Mike, actually. You brought this to my attention. Yeah, yeah. I remember seeing that link. I was like, oh, Jeff needs this. Yep. And I think this was after we planned on recording this episode. Yeah, I think it was just around that, like, that week or something yeah happy coincidences but i am excited to see the soundtrack on a vinyl pressing i don't know if that means a remaster i'm not sure what exactly we're going to get but what we do know is that we're going to get all the tracks that we talked about here in this episode we are also going to get an additional laugh and peace track called rainbow three minutes long have no idea what it sounds like i will make sure to report back after i give it a listen i am really looking forward to this well that brings us to post-release and (sighs) God, there's not a whole lot that we can really say here. So Nana Onsha went on to release a spinoff game, uh, Moji Ribbon, in 2003, and the more faithful sequel, Vib Ripple, in 2004, both on the PS2 in Japan. More colorful, shifting focus to calligraphy and color and photos. Matsura continues to develop games with Nana Onsha. They've released games for the Tamagotchi franchise that would sell more than a million copies in Japan alone. Uh, produced one of the only games on the iPod Classic. Remember when there were games there? With the click wheel. Yep. Yep, yep. There's a port of Sonic, I think, on that thing. It was so yes, weird. Yes, there is. <laughs> uh, released Furusoma on iOS and Google Play, and they even put an ambitious rap battle game on Kickstarter in 2017. It failed, but the concept of a rap battle simulator is extremely fascinating, if not a little too ambitious. I get that. Um, that's unfortunate. Matsura has also continued to work as a composer, lending tracks to a multitude of projects and releasing his own album on vinyl in 2014. Interesting fact here, he's also the first and only Japanese Japanese Emeritus member of the advisory board for the Game Developers Conference. That's nice. a big deal. Yeah, yeah. Game Developers Conference in the U.S. is a rather big deal. Everybody talks about it when it comes around to the extent of like E3. Mike, that is our episode on Nana Onsha, the soundtracks of Parappa the Rapper and Vib Ribbon, and of course, a little bit about Laugh and Peace. I mean, what else is there to say? This has been a very long recording for us, but a lot of very interesting info here on Masura and his projects. I don't know if maybe you can tell from uh, actually listening to it, but you and I 
I, I mean, we don't live that far apart. We've always traditionally recorded these together in person. Um, this is actually the first Jeff and Mike lo-fi recording that we're doing properly socially distanced from each other in our own respective houses. Uh, so that was a, a little different in that regard, too. Yeah, but you know what? We're not done. In fact, Mike, what do you say we continue down this path of quirky video game soundtracks? Na 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 Dum de dum de dum de dum de. All right, go ahead and end it. That was our discussion on Parappa the Rapper in Vibribbon from Nana Onsha. We are always interested in hearing what you have to say about the topics we discuss. So please join the conversation on our subreddit or send us your take on this topic, feedback at lowfidelity.info. Next time on the show, we will review the soundtrack to the video game Katamari Damashi. Until then, thank you for listening to Low Fidelity, and we'll see you again in the next episode. 